Our next speaker uh, comes from London, although he has spent a number of years in Silicon Valley before that, before he moved to United Kingdom. Uh, Diraj Mukherjee is our guest speaker today. He has worked for various consulting companies, non-profit, and in 2000 he also started his own company, Shazam Entertainment. You may be heard of that. Shazam is an expression used when something unusual or unbelievable occurs. And Diraj will talk about the magic of innovation. Diraj, the floor you is yours. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me OK. Um, I called this for today the magical mystique of innovation and doing your own magic. Because sometimes you hear that people think of innovation as something mystical. You know, How do you do it? How, how does it all happen? And actually, maybe there's some magic behind it, um, but you know, not really. It's just pieces which come together. And I just thought, rather than saying it's X or Y or Z, just talk about some of the stories that uh, we went through at, uh, at Shazam. Um, and a little bit about doing your own magic, you know, just some, some ideas. So I'll leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, this is the only uh, good-looking gentleman in this presentation, by the way, and didn't work at, at, at Shazam. So. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'll tell you a little bit about Shazam, um, some of the stories behind it, um, and then just open up to questions. So, uh, Milan has already uh, introduced me, which is which is nice. So my, my background is I'm from India. I grew up a little bit all over the world. I lived in Europe. Uh, I went to college in the US. Um, I did my MBA at uh, at Stanford University in the early days of the internet, which was which was lucky. And then I spent about 15 years, roughly, in innovation. I worked for a startup in Silicon Valley. Um, I moved to London to start the company for, for my old firm, um, and then started my own company. But after that as well, I've worked as a consultant, as an innovation consultant, for instance, with, uh, with Reuters. And uh, currently, I'm with a company called Infosys. So we uh, advise large companies about uh, the social web and, and, and social business. So that's. Uh, my background, so it's it's a little bit of you know being completely sort of alone, uh, trying to do things which haven't been done before, but also working with people who are trying things for the first time. Before I go on, so who here uh, is an entrepreneur? Who has their own business? Okay, several hands. Oh no, too many hands. <laughs> okay, <laughs> who who wants to be an entrepreneur? Who would like to be an entrepreneur? Okay, so. So lots of people with experience with their own firm. OK. Now, I, I thought I'd speak mostly about Shazam, because it's one of these things which it's an old company. The company was started in 2000. It's ancient when it comes to, to startups. It's still around. It refuses to go away. And now people have actually heard of it. Which is amazing, because I, I remember when, in the early days, when I'd introduce it, and people would say, what, you know, it, it would never, I, I went on a date once, where uh, this woman actually, she was absolutely horrified. She advised me strongly to stop right away. You know? who, who here has heard of Shazam? OK. Let me tell you a little bit about what the company does for, for those who haven't heard of it. Um, basically, it, it's, it's a way to identify music using your mobile phone. So if you hear a song, you're in a bar or a pub or a club or on the radio, and you hear a song and you don't know what it is, and you go, what? So you can take out your mobile, you can dial a number in the old days or use an app, and it tells you the name of the song and the artist. And then you can go on from there, for instance, if you want to watch the video of the track or buy the song or a, a whole bunch of things like finding out information about, about the artist. So uh, uh, for those of you who have used it, uh, you come up to me afterwards and tell me how to make it better. I'm sure it's OK. I, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, if you haven't used it before, then give it a go. As I said, it's been around for, for a very long time. And um, it's actually kind of changing as it goes as well. It's unusual, because nowadays there's a word for when you change your business. It's called pivot. The word pivot didn't actually exist back in those days. But Shazam is quite unusual in the sense it didn't really change that much. It started off as music identification. It stayed music identification. What's changed now is that it can be used for different things. So for instance, you're watching an ad on TV, and you want to know a little bit more. You can use the Shazam app to interact with the ad. So it uses music recognition 
to be able to then get more content. For instance, you can enter a prize draw, you can uh, contribute to charity, you can uh, get more content. For instance, this is a, a screenshot from uh, Britain's Got Talent, which ran in the UK about, uh, about a week ago or so. And uh, I, I just got this slide yesterday from, from the team at Shazam. I saw this once being presented. Uh, by the way, I've never presented about Shazam before. So this is my first time ever. If you like it, tell me afterwards. If you don't like it, I, I'll look out for the comments on the, on the tweet stream there. But uh, uh, so this, this, this is the, the graph which, uh, when I saw this presented at a conference, uh, the guy who was presenting said, and I joined the company right here. Uh, so, which was true, that's when, when he joined. I, on the other hand, was responsible for this bit right here, you see? So um, uh, I, I was there for the first uh, three or four years. Uh, I'm not actively involved day to day anymore. Uh, the founders share a seat on the board. Uh, so most of the stories I'll tell you about are from, from, from the old days, if you will. That point where it started uh, moving upwards was actually the time when the iPhone was launched. And the iPhone fundamentally changed the game for Shazam and I guess really opened up the whole world of possibilities for mobile apps. So th the fact that the line has gone like that makes me really happy. What really annoys me is the flat bit from 2000 to 2007 when I was most actively involved, which basically contributed pretty much nothing. Uh, and the reason I'm annoyed is because I, I remember I wrote the business plan. Um, there was a week back in 2000, and my co-founder had gone um, sailing, had gone on holiday, and I wrote the business plan in that week. It was long days, and I specifically read the research, which predicted that the smartphones would be there by 2004, 2005, we'd have uh, two, uh, you know, uh, two megabits per second on phones, and they just didn't turn up. So we're sitting there just waiting for things to happen, and the environment wasn't there. When the iPhone was launched, then everything changed. And it's just one of those things where, you know, in a world of uncertainty, we could have gone bust many, many times over. But I'm glad I'm here to show that bit of the graph, which I'm not really responsible for. But. OK, uh, so if we rewind to the beginning, um, so that Motley crew is the, 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 the four co-founders. Uh, this was uh, taken four or five years ago. Um, I, I, I look younger there. Um, my uh, co-founders haven't aged gracefully either, but uh, in the middle is, uh, is Chris Barton, who was a very good friend of mine. We used to live in the Bay Area, live in San Francisco, uh, spend time together. Uh, the, the, the third person there is, uh, is Dr. Avery Wang. So he actually invented the algorithm which, which powers Shazam. And the fourth person is a guy called Philippe Engelbrecht. And he's the reason I'm here today, because Philippe knows Ogi, who's sitting uh, right there in, in the corner. And uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to have a chance to talk a little bit about uh, the old days. So I guess that as I, as I thought about what, what might be interesting, to me, it was all about the group coming together and being able to you know, bounce ideas off each other. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more as we, as, as we go along. So the first time that I actually heard about the idea for what is now Shazam, we actually called it Aardvark. Um, we, di we didn't go forward with that name. It could have been big, but... Um, and this, this was the cover. So name that tune from your mobile phone anywhere and anytime. And how this happened was that, so Chris and I, we just, we wanted to be entrepreneurs. Uh, we lived in Silicon Valley. This was 97, 98, 99, the, so the big boom of uh, the first wave of, of the internet. And it just sounded like a fun thing to be an entrepreneur. But we didn't have uh, any ideas. Uh, we didn't have too many skills. And um, so we just basically sat around, drank beers, talking about, wouldn't it be fun to start a company? Chris had a good friend from business school, who's Philippe, uh, and he's from, from Belgium. And I'd never met him, but he said, oh, Philippe is a great guy. If, if, if I ever started a company, I'd love to do something with Philippe. Now, when we, we were brainstorming ideas, we threw around different ideas, you know, some which were really bad, some which were just crazy, 
uh, and some which were impossible, like, like, like Aardvark. And why Aardvark? Because, because it was a mobile service, and in those days people had your contacts in your phone book, so we thought if it started with AA, it would be the first thing in your phone book. So then you, could, you hear a song and you, you pull it out and you dial it, right? And uh, I mean, it went beyond this. So we had little, uh, you know, uh, clip arts of art box and stuff. It was really difficult to actually work with it. So fortunately, we moved off from that. And, um, and it, Shazam, which is uh, the original name, is, is still with us today. People sometimes ask me, how, how did, how did this name Shazam come about? And uh, the reality is that it was a code name. We said, let's be entrepreneurs. We don't have an idea, but that doesn't matter. Um, let's have a code name. We'll call it Shazam, whatever, whatever it happens to be. And then when we came up with the idea for Shazam, then we spent a lot of money, which we didn't have, on consultants trying to rename it, and we couldn't find a better name. So we just kept it, kept it as Shazam, even though it sounds stupid. Um, now it sounds clever because like, oh, there's something magical about how you can identify this song out of thin air. It works so well with the name. It was just dumb luck, basically. It was just the code name. Okay. Um, even today, when people have heard about Shazam, so people still say, oh, it's a brilliant idea. And, you know, people understand the idea when you explain it to them. And they look at me like, they're like, oh, wow, that's brilliant. I'm like, it wasn't my idea. They go, oh, not so brilliant then, you know. Uh, that's okay, I can, I can live with that. So the man with the number nine shirt, Chris, my co-founder, came up with the idea for Shazam. So people think he's so smart, you know. He's not, <laughs> I shouldn't say, <laughs> don't, don't, don't film that. No, he's a smart, he's a smart guy. But it's, not, it's not just like this unbelievably visionary genius flat. He's got lot, lots of ideas. And I think many of us have, have lots of ideas. Actually, the way he came up with this idea is because he's rubbish at music. So he's always like, oh, what, what, what's that song? And, and, and um, he was lying awake thinking, um, how could he fix this problem? And he thought, oh, I have an idea. What we could do is hook up into all the different radio stations and know what they're playing so that at any time you could find out what was on the radio station, which seemed like a good way of solving the problem. And then he thought, how, how, how could you do better than that? What would beat that idea? And he thought, what if your phone could actually identify the music regardless of what was being played? So that would beat it. So that's how he came up with, that, with the idea for Shazam. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, if you hear the idea, you go, yeah, it's a good idea. But he came about it through a structured process. He was a first-year MBA student at Berkeley, and he'd been taught, when you have an idea, look at the threats. So actually, even though it's, it's an elegant and simple idea, it came about through thinking and thinking through it. So when I first heard the idea, I said, look, that's just ridiculous, you know. I mean, that's, that's, a, I mean, it's, it, that's a ridiculous idea. He said, yeah, but I asked my dad, and he thinks it could work. It's like, your dad? Is your dad a, rec a music recognition expert? He's like, no, no, he's a nuclear physicist. I said, look, uh, fine, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's give it a go. Because I just w I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So, and I'm quite analytical because I used to be a, a management consultant and I have an MBA. So I took out a little spreadsheet and a little spreadsheet. Chances of inventing the algorithm, 30%. Chance of raising money, oh God, 25%. Chance of finding millions of tracks. You, and you multiply it through. And it was like, in my spreadsheet, there's a 4% chance of the thing actually working. So that, yeah, good, let's, let's do it. I, but you know, it was just a wild, Overestimate. Is one of my investors in the room? Anybody invest? Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. I, this is all strictly off the record, Brett. Okay. Um, it was a wild overestimate, 4%. There's no way. It was much lower than that. But anyway, there you go. Okay. So the next bit. So now we had the team. We had a code name. We had an idea. But we didn't have the technology. And so we didn't even know what the domain was. So we're like, we need to find an inventor to invent this thing. And so we, w but we didn't know where to look. So, but we couldn't tell people what we were looking for because that would give the idea away. So it's really awkward. You're like, we're looking for this domain where we can find an inventor for something I can't tell you about. Um, 
this is why I was invited to speak, right? Okay. Um, so, so then we worked out it's digital signal processing. So we kept that in mind. And then we started hunting around for people in digital signal processing. And it turned out I was living in London at the time. And my co-founders were living uh, in, in California. They were at, at Berkeley. It just so happened that the centers of excellence for digital signal processing were at Stanford and at Berkeley. So dumb luck, they were in the right place at the right time. So what they did was they basically went to the head of the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics at Stanford University, which sounded very impressive. And uh, they said, look, we need an inventor. Who is the best PhD student that you've had ever? So um, Dr. Julia Smith, who later became an advisor and ran this institute, he was a very kind man. He didn't throw them out. He said, well, the best PhD students are, you know, th this is the list. So uh, Chris and, and, and Philippe went out and started interviewing the candidates, trying to gauge whether they'd be the right fit. And pretty much every single meeting that they had, they got thrown out. So they'd talk to somebody and they'd say, get out. <laughs> You're wasting my time. Avery is the only one who said, well, let me think about it. We said, you're hired. He's the only one who said, as soon as he said, let me think about it, that's it. So he became our fourth co-founder. Uh, stop me if I'm if misrepresenting anything, but uh, this, is, this, is, this is pretty accurate. So now we had the team, and we said, okay, the next step is we need to raise some money and you know, get this thing going because you know, you're not really a proper entrepreneur until you have money and, and all that stuff. So Avery, can you invent the algorithm by like next month, you know. So he's like, well, I'll try it. Now Avery, is, he's, he's a shy guy. He doesn't like to say no, buzz off, you know. He said, well, I'll try it. So okay, great. So now I've got three MBAs, fresh, over-enthusiastic MBAs, and one poor uh, inventor. All he said, I'll try. And that's it, we got going, right? So we're write, writing the business plan, you know, talking to angels while Avery's trying to invent the algorithm. The good news is, and this is the only part which is hard to actually recreate, everything else is, is relatively straightforward, he's a genius. So that was lucky, and uh, you know, not everyone is a genius, and he's got a list of patents you know, this long in his name, etc. and I don't think I'll ever meet anyone in my life who uh, you know, can create something like that, but these things, uh, these things happen. So Avery very kindly invented the algorithm. Um, I haven't actually quite worked out how it works, but I take credit for it all the time. So uh, if people ask, I say, oh yeah, the algorithm. I mean, it wasn't just my idea. Avery helped out a lot, but uh, no, I, I don't actually say that. But basically, the, uh, the, the, the challenge was with a small sample of music, uh, 15 seconds, over a mobile phone which creates distortion, then you've got background noise trying to match against you know, millions of songs, because it could be any song, instantly, because consumers don't want to wait, at a low cost, so you have a business. Um, now, how did he actually do that? Um, I think he was about to give up. He, he said to us later, he's like, he got to a point, we'd been trying for a month or two, and he couldn't work it out, and he was just preparing himself to break the news to us. He was gonna say, guys, I tried, but I failed, you know, this is how it goes, and uh, we should just get on with the rest of our lives. And as he was preparing his speech, he had this insight where he actually worked out how he could solve this problem. And the way it works is, no, never mind. Next slide, I, I can't explain it, but it's, it's, some, it's something to do with, there's a diagonal line which looks at the time and the, the something, but, okay. Um, so we, once we had, we had that bit, so now we needed money. Um, so we decided to do an angel round. So this is one of our angels, uh, not just because he's, he's carrying beer, but he actually you know, coughed up cash as well. Um, we went the usual kind of friends and family route. So I, I used to work, work with Michael Keeney, he, he was my boss. Uh, we tried, uh, as much as possible to get people who would add value to the business. I think one of the things which we did well in, in retrospect is that we weren't shy. So for instance, we thought, you know, the music business, we knew nothing about the music business at all. I, I, in fact, we, we, 
I mean, the reason Chris came up with the idea in the first place because he knew nothing about music. So we were, you know, frankly disadvantaged. So we said, we went to the chairman of EMI and said, would you like to invest in our business? We turned up 20 minutes late for the meeting because we got lost, couldn't find our way there. This penthouse apartment showed him the demo, showed him the business plan, and I, at the end of the hour, he's like, sure, I'll invest. So we were amazed because we, it, it's hard to believe you could actually pull this off. So we got even more ambitious. Uh, we went to the chief technologist of BT and said, would you like to invest in our business? Um, we just got back from a camping weekend, I remember. We hadn't shaved for two days. I was wearing shorts. And we walked into this sort of posh hotel and, and showed him the demo. And he jumped up and he ran out and he brought another investor in as well. He said, you have to see this demo, you know. So we're like, this is great. Uh, and so we just basically reached as high as we could in terms of people who could help us, who would give us credibility, who had the experience, and, um, and that worked really well. We, we, it, 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 and I think back now, I was thinking on the flight over, I mean, wh what, what were the lessons learned, if anything? I, I just, it was just sheer audacity, but I think it really helped. Um, hiring the dream team. So this was the next, the, the next step, if you will. So there were four of us in the beginning. Once, uh, the first round that we did, the, the angel round, was uh, about a million dollars. Uh, I, I won't embarrass anyone by, uh, by naming who is uh, our biggest benefactor. But at this point, we were ready to, to build the team. The great news is that we had a terrible, terrible sense of timing. So we started the company in the year 2000, which was a pretty good year until things started going wrong. And it went down and down. So I think this, the, the peak of the stock market, if I'm not mistaken, was March 2000, which is exactly the day I left my well-paid job. When the market went up for three months, I saw a buying opportunity, so I bought shares, which they kept going down and down. So <laughs> not very clever. But by the time it came to 2001, there were loads of people who were either looking for a job or you know, things were, were not looking good. And it gave us a chance to hire people who we thought were excellent, who uh, we could work with, who could really you know, buy into what we were trying to create. Uh, and that was really lucky. So uh, there was lots of pain about being around at that time. But this was one of the, the good things. And uh, so we ended up, I remember being in, uh, in Munich for Oktoberfest. And I bumped into Christian, who was uh, surfing badly at the desk uh, on, on the left over there. And he, uh, I, th I thought he was uh, a, a great guy. Uh, he was out of a job six months later. So we just flew in to Munich and hired a whole team of first-rate developers. They, li they literally they lost their jobs. We took them into the next room, and we offered them a job with our startup in London. And they said, yes. So we happened to get this excellent core team. Look back now, and the nice thing was that we had a chance to build a team who were like us in some sense, who saw an opportunity and, and seized it. There were four people on that team. Three of them took the offer, and one of them didn't. But it felt like you know, we were doing something which was, it was completely going against the tide. Lots of people jumped into startups in 98, 99, 2000, not in 2001. And that made a big difference for, for how Shazam evolved from there. Ah, <laughs> now the, 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 the real deal, which is uh, persuading the VCs. So a million dollars sounds like a lot of money. I would have kept it and spent it. But you actually have to build the business with it. And a million dollars goes really quickly, unfortunately. Particularly, are there any lawyers in the room? Any lawyers? Yeah, if you have lawyers, then the million dollars goes particularly quickly. So we needed VC money. Now, VCs in 2001 were notoriously difficult to, uh, to approach and get them to part with cash. So Chris, who uses fairly blunt techniques, basically spammed every VC in London saying, would you like to meet with us? I think we had about 50 different VC meetings. There was very few VCs in the UK we did not meet in 2000 and 2001. And they all turned us down. And they're like, look, it's too risky. You guys, you have a little prototype, uh, which is interesting. Uh, it's not production scale. You don't have music. You don't have the system. 
you don't have any proof that consumers want it, go away. So like, fine, we'll go to the next one then. When you've gone through 50 VCs, it's hard to say we'll go to the next one because there weren't any others. So luckily, there's one guy called RJ who was a brand new VC, had never done a deal before. And he, <laughs> is, is this being recorded? Okay. Uh, and he loved music. And he thought this is a great thing. So we like latched on to RJ, you know. And um, we sent him an email saying, you need a lead VC and then others will follow. And so Chris sent him a one line email. He's like, do you have a lead? And so RJ, we didn't realize, he uses short form emails as well. So he wrote back, yes. So like, excellent. So RJ was the first one. And then we got a couple of other VCs, one uh, called the uh, Flanders Language Valley Fund, FLV from, from Belgium. Uh, and a third, which was Lynx, which was an um, investment arm of, of Virgin. But it took nine, nine months, 10 months to actually close that deal, which was just basically persistence. We just refused to take no for an answer. When you get 49 no's, then, you know, it become, after a while you go, what, no, that's fine. The next, no, okay, no ways, you know. But when we got that yes, and we closed that round, it was eight and a half million dollars was the first round in uh, 2001, July 23rd, 2001. It felt fantastic. It felt great. Because then we had the elements that we needed to get on and, and, and get the service going. Okay, so did I, did I mention the, the music database bit? Um, so there were two problems. One is, we didn't have a music database. Uh, so, and the music database just didn't exist. So we talked to the record companies. We said, we, can we do a deal so we can access your music database? They said, what music database? Um, and uh, we, we looked at other potential partners, but it literally didn't exist. So we actually had to go out and build the entire music database from scratch ourselves, which is a silly thing to do. And if you've got eight and a half million dollars, you'll spend it pretty quickly if you, if you try to do that. If you fast forward 10 years, if you ask the record companies, can we have your music database? They say, we're working on it. I, it, it was unbelievably uh, you know, naive of us at the time. And the way we got away with it is because Philippe, my co-founder, did this amazing deal with the biggest distributor of music in the UK, called, they're called EUK. And they had this giant warehouse with every single CD which can be bought in the UK. And if you imagine, like the biggest superstore has 20, 30, 40,000 titles. So they had you know, 100,000 CDs in their warehouse. And so the deal he did was to co-locate in their facility to set up uh, ripping stations so we could digitize the music, add the metadata, extract fingerprints, which is what Shazam needs to actually do the recognition, return the CDs to them, and then get out of there in time so we could launch. So at one point, we had three shifts of temporary workers running, working eight hours a day, 25 workers, you know, doing nothing but digitizing this music, adding the metadata, putting the CD back, returning it, and it was run by this man called Bart. And Bart was a US Marine, and he knew how to make things happen. Bart was one of the best things that happened to us. And, um, and uh, he, could, he, could, he could drink us under the table. It was absolutely unbelievable. But things just worked. Things just happened. So uh, the timeline basically is we set up in 2000. Uh, we uh, got the, the VC round away in 2001. And then it took us 13 months to actually get to market. 13 months is a lot. Now, nowadays, 13 months, I mean, yeah, it's, just, it's difficult to think of a business which takes 13 months to get to market. And I was seriously worried that we would run out of cash. Uh, we were executing on just a number of different fronts at the same time. So we were building the algorithm, which Avery was driving with a, with a small team, and improving its accuracy, improving its reliability, improving its efficiency. We were building the, uh, the platform underneath which supported uh, the inbound calls, doing the recognition, delivering the text message back. We were m building this massive database of music that, that I've described. At the same time, uh, Chris was running around doing deals with the mobile operators because we really wanted to have a short code 
so that you could dial a single number to be able to access the service, regardless of which operator you were on. And so we came up with this, this idea. So, uh, a friend of mine actually had this idea, which was the number was going to be 2580, which was the numbers which are straight down the middle of the phone. And so we were trying as well to convince our partners to give us that number. And I remember there was, uh, we, we, um, we called O2, which was one of the big operators in, in the UK, still is. So Chris called this guy 10 times trying to get a meeting, didn't get a response. So he said, do you mind calling him? I'm getting fed up with this. I said, sure. I called him 10 times, couldn't get hold of him. So I said, look, Chris, back to you. It's, 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 it's your job, right? So he called him another 10 times. We counted, so in total, we called him 43 times. Never called back. On the 44th time, we got hold of him. He's like, oh yeah, sure, let's meet on Tuesday. He didn't say, you guys left me 43 messages. He's like, oh yeah, sure, let's meet on Tuesday. So, I mean, it was unbelievable how it was just, we're gonna call again, we're gonna try again, we're gonna call again, we're gonna set up that meeting, we're gonna try to make it happen. I would not have believed it if I hadn't made 20 of those calls myself which got us to launch, and I didn't put pictures of launch because, because it's being filmed, but um, uh, it, it, was, it was great to actually be live, be able to put that service in people's hands, and people would say, oh yeah, that's a great idea. What's the number? Like 2580 down the middle of the mobile? Or you'd be like, oh yeah, yes, I've, I've heard of it. What's the number? Whatever you did, it was not enough to actually you know, kind of build that traction. But we started to get the first little signals of consumer acceptance, which is what it's all about. I've, as I said, talked a lot about the, uh, the early days. And if you fast forward, this is, this is, a, this is an old slide. This is from, from 2002. Gradually, the awareness started building in terms of this was something different. This was something which uh, people liked because, you know, Someone said to me just just before this talk, say, "Oh, when they heard about Shazam, they're like, yeah, that happens to me all the time. I have, I, I hear a song and I don't know what it is, and I want to find out uh, 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 w w what it's called." So you know, now if I mean, it, when 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 I speak to people and they they go, "Oh yes, that's great. You know, I use it all the time. Oh yes, that's that's great. I I, I find it really handy." But these stories don't really come out. And they're like, yeah, there's something almost magical about how it actually does it, you know. And uh, it's, it's, it's nice to hear. Uh, my, now my biggest point of stress is that uh, my daughter, who's five years old, now knows about Shazam. So she'll hear a song, and she'll grab the phone, and she'll try to recognize it. But if it doesn't work, <laughs> then I'm in big trouble. So uh, that, that, that's the thing which, which, which worries me now. But, you know, there wasn't really any particular magic in this. And I guess that for me, people say to me, they're like, oh, do you ever think about being an entrepreneur again? You know? I was like, yeah, I do think about being an entrepreneur again. They say, what, what would you do differently from, from what you did at Shazam? And for me, <coughs> very little, actually. The, what, the thing about Shazam is that it needed lots of capital up front. So we raised eight and a half million dollars and then another you know, four or five and then another two. I think it took us about $20 million just to, you know, just to get to 2003, 2004. There's been a couple of rounds since then, more recently, larger rounds, but as the business has been successful. But for me, if I just go back, and if I, if I were to do another startup, or if I take away the things which worked, was the, f the first one was, was just friendship. And so because Chris and I were friends, uh, Philippe and Chris were friends, and we enjoyed spending time together. We enjoyed each other's company. And that made a big difference because we, I mean, literally there were, years and years where we could have gone bankrupt any week. And we had to check the accounts. Are we bankrupt? No, we're not. Okay, great. Because you can't, if you're, if you're trading insolvent, then you can go to jail. So you have to be sure that you're not actually bankrupt. But it's like, are we, in, are we bankrupt? No. Okay, good. You know, month after month, year after year. In those times, it really helps. Wow. Uh, yeah, so, uh, we, we, and we really enjoyed it. We really enjoyed the process. We had, a, we had a, a really fun time. And I had a, f I had a French boss once. He kept asking me, like, are you having fun? Are you having fun? Uh, every day he'd ask me, are you having fun? I was like, yeah. And I realized, uh, yeah, I'm having fun. Like, that, that was so important to me. 
And now it's, it's, it's part of my philosophy, I guess, which is if you're having fun, then you can overcome problems. You can get over, you can make 43 phone calls, the same guy who doesn't respond, if you're still enjoying yourself, you know, as you, as you go along. And then the third one, which is, for me, it was more subtle, but it's about values. And along the way, we came across several different situations where we just realized that some people had a different value system. So you've got power, you've got money, or you've got control, or you've got a contract, and, and you do something which leverages that, but it doesn't always help. If you look at somebody and you go, that's how you should treat someone fairly, or that's the right thing to do. We had to do things like we had to you know, lay people off along the way as well. You know. And I, I would always try to work with people, whether it's partners or employees or customers, where you have uh, a sense of shared values. But I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. So uh, when, when, when we set up the company, uh, you know, as I described, we didn't really have a, a, a specific idea, and we didn't really have a, a structure either. And, uh, and Chris came up with the idea for, for Shazam, and you know, th th it wasn't obvious who was going to run the business. And he said, you know, I'd, like to, I'd like to run the business. I said, sure, you know, go for it. Um, in a different circumstance, maybe, maybe I would have been the CEO, but you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of hassle. And he said, okay, I'd like to divide the equity equally between all the founders. I said, really? Because you know, you're gonna run the show, it's a lot of responsibility, and, and uh, you know, it was your idea. He said, no, I wanna make sure that we all feel the same way about uh, the company and our involvement. And that, to me, I, just, I was trying to think of an anecdote which illustrates what I mean about values. That's somebody who's not, it's not transactional. It's about, we're in this together, you know, it's, it's, I think it's the right thing to do. This is how we want to work together. So it's really putting, putting values, putting it, things in practice. And that's a really subtle one. Uh, friendship and fun, I think, a little bit easier. But recognizing when people think in that way, for me, is, is, is really precious. So that's, uh, that's, that's about it, really. I don't think there's much more I want, I want to add, and I'm quite conscious that we're pretty close to the end of the time. So I'll just open up to any questions. Thank you. Hi, um, I, I, I missed uh, the first few minutes of the presentation, so I, I might have uh, missed the part where you said how Shazam makes money. Ah. That's that's what I'm, what I totally don't get about Shazam. Even though sure. I use it and I, uh, it really helps me. Uh -huh. I love music, uh -huh. and when I hear something uh, either on the radio or in a club, and I really love it, and I'm frustrated. I used to be frustrated because I cannot ask anyone or don't know what it is. Uh, now, in something like 60% of, uh, of the cases, I can uh, uh, know what it is. So right. It's okay, great. great. Thank you. No, I didn't talk about it at all. So we started off with a uh, consumer paper use model. So it was, it was a new mechanism called reverse charge SMS. So you'd make a phone call. Uh, there'd be 15 seconds of music and then the consumer would receive a text message with the name of the song and the artist, and that text message cost them 50 pence in the UK to receive. If it didn't work, if it didn't identify, it was a free text. If it did work, it would charge you 50 pence. Uh, so that was the original business model. And then it's just changed many times since then. We've had a, an app, which was a paid for app. Uh, we've had a, a free app and a premium app. Uh, we've had, uh, and then now advertising is one of the, the, the bigger and growing revenue streams on the free app because uh, it's, there's lo lots of uh, advertising opportunities. And uh, what's happening uh, more and more now is that uh, you know, there's, there's things that carry a pre-installed. So, so mobile operators or handset will, will, will pay Shazam to uh, provide it on the handset. And then the last one, which is quite interesting, is that um, right back in the early days, we talked about selling music. And I said, I said, look, you know, there's something called Napster, which was uh, big in those days. You know, the, uh, people were just downloading music for free. Napster, fortunately, you know, went away. But when iTunes came up, Shazam is one of the biggest contributors of revenue to iTunes uh, in terms of, mm, yeah, yeah. So that, that is now a significant revenue stream.
Hi, uh, Nikola Celanovic, Novi Sad. Just one boring question. Uh, how is the capital structure now that you've had so many rounds and rounds and rounds? Yeah. Of course, I understand people don't do it all for money, but then as they're yeah. growing older and their families are growing, and yeah. how is how about that? Yeah, no, don't, don't tell my wife that she's not doing it for the money because she keeps hoping, you know, she's hoping one day. <laughs> No, the, v the VCs, of course, own the majority of the business. Uh, employees and, and management own a chunk of the business. And, uh, you know, ex-employees and founders have a, have, have a small percentage. But we did, uh, around in 2001, 2003, 2004, which were very, very difficult times to, to fund, actually. So there's uh, a, a lot of dilution. But at the end of the day, I, I actually do believe that being here to tell the story is, is more precious than either uh, going bust because you couldn't agree terms or having a, 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 sp a, you know, a, a really early exit. And I know lots of people who, you know, it just didn't work out. So uh, that's, that's, been, that's been our um, the Shazam story in terms of just, you know, doing rounds at not great times. And then the last couple of rounds have been in, in much better times and really, you know, top tier VCs who, who are now uh, involved with the company as well. So it's, uh, that's, the, that's the capital structure. Hi, Diraj. Um, we're, I was expecting that uh, Shazam would be a uh, startup company, uh, but y your company was established in 2000, so it's 12 years. It's a pretty mature company. And do people still refer to Shazam uh, when they think of it as a startup company only in the, because of the line of business it's in um, and because uh, it's very popular recently with the very popular other businesses that have started off uh, recently. So how do you look at that? Are you a mature company? Are you a milking cow, uh, like in this cycle, or a startup, yeah. forever young? Yeah, I think that's right. No, it's a very old startup, but I think of us as, as still a startup because of the, the spirit and the uh, mentality in terms of there's been lots of innovation in the last few years. So Shazam for TV, for instance, is, is, is brand new, and it taps an entirely different market, which is being uh, providing a, a two-way path for viewers of TV. It's, uh, you know, TV advertising is a $600 billion global market. You know? uh, we, we basically invented the category for music recognition. So, it, but TV advertising, uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it's huge. And um, the algorithm itself, in terms of being able to recognize in, in real time. So th when, you, when you walk into the office, you get this buzz, you get this energy. You know, people are you know, dedicated. And uh, this, this excitement of, you know, we're kind of changing things as, as we go along. So it's still a startup. It's about 150 people, which is, you know, a reasonable size. But it's not, uh, yeah, it's like, a, it's like a kidult. It's, uh, it's quite old, but it still behaves like a, like a young startup, you know. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Diraj. Thank you, Diraj, for inspirational presentation.